Today we are going to make a switching regulator. What I am holding in my hand right now is a switching regulator. Most people probably don't know what a switching regulator is, so let me explain first. This is one example of where a switching regulator is used. In this, a switching regulator is used in the power supply around the CPU of a computer. This is the motherboard of the computer and this is the power supply. The 12 volts from the power supply are plugged in directly to the power supply around the CPU of the PC. The voltage coming from the power supply is 12 volts, but those 12 volts cannot be directly supplied to the CPU. Rather, it is important to drop the voltage from 12 to 1.2 volts for the CPU. The 12 volts coming from the power supply are run through the switching regulator, which is over here, and that is what converts the voltage to 1.2 for the CPU. This is the configuration of the switching regulator around the CPU of the computer. There are two sets of MOSFETs in this section, an inductor right here, and an electrolytic capacitor for output. This is the input electrolytic capacitor. Through the use of the MOSFET, the 12 volts for the CPU can be reduced to 1.2 volts. The example I just showed used the motherboard for a desktop, but it's the exact same for a laptop. This is where the CPU is located, and if you flip it to the back, this is where the switching regulator is. The MOSFET and the electrolytic. This is a multi-layer ceramic capacitor and an inductor. Using these, I can reduce the voltage of the laptop's AC adapter down to 1.2 volts for the CPU. If you look at this circuit diagram, you can see how the switching regulators interact with the CPU. By taking the power supply's 12 volts and converting it using the MOSFET, the voltage can be reduced to be used by the CPU. The components used for this are the MOSFET, inductor, and capacitor. Before we talk about how this circuit works, let's start building the circuit and leave the complicated stuff for later on in the video. After designing the printed circuit board using Easy EDA, I will manufacture the printed circuit board using JLC PCB. So let's start the process of making the switching regulator. This is the printed circuit board for the switching regulator. Along with the printed circuit board, I also ordered a stencil, which will be used to apply the solder paste. The components used this time are only surface mount components, so the stencil will make it easier for us to solder them. These are the rest of the components. I bought these from a Chinese store called LCSC, which sells electronic components. All right, let's apply the solder paste now. When applying solder paste, it's nice to have extra substrate. Place the boards like this and place the piece that you're going to apply the solder paste to in between them. Use something like masking tape or really any other tape to secure the surrounding boards down. So this is a stencil, and as I'll show you, these holes align with the patterns of the printed circuit board. Now with the masking tape, we're going to stabilize just the top part of the stencil. This is so that we can remove the stencil right after applying the solder paste, which will make the process a lot easier. After applying some solder paste to the top of the stencil, use something flat like a card to push the paste into the holes of the stencil. This is how you apply solder paste. The left side is after the solder paste has been applied, while the right side is without the solder paste. After applying the solder paste to everything, we can now move on to putting the components on the surface. 
We'll use this 2.2 microfarad multi-layer ceramic capacitor for the input and this multi-layer ceramic capacitor for the output. This one is 22 microfarads. This is a switching regulator IC that I purchased from Texas Instruments. This is a shock key barrier diode. This is a resistor for output voltage feedback, one of two resistors I'll be using. And this is the second one. This is the bootstrap capacitor. There's a set of these in the switching regulator which are used to supply voltage to the gate drive circuit. After this, we need to melt the solder paste. Since I don't have a reflow oven, I'll be using either a bread baking oven or a hot plate as a substitute. To make things easier for you all to see, I'll be using this heat gun. After reflowing the surface of the board, I'll put the inductor on the back side. Now that we've finished the assembly, we need to test if it works properly. This square on the diagram is the switching regulator we just assembled. Even if the input voltage of the switching regulator fluctuates, as long as the output voltage remains constant at 5 volts, it means the regulator is working properly. So I'm going to set the current to 0.5 amperes. Even if the input voltage fluctuates between 7 and 30 volts, the output should remain the same. So, let's go ahead and test it. Let's assemble the circuit on this breadboard. There's already a monolithic ceramic capacitor on the board, but I'm also going to add an electrolytic capacitor on the outside, a 10 ohm resistor, and also a probe to monitor the voltage. And this is how it looks now. Bring in a suitable power supply, turn it on, and you should get a voltage of 14. I'm looking at the input voltage and the output voltage using an oscilloscope. Now we press the switch, and there it is. The yellow waveform is the output voltage waveform, and the blue one is for input. As you can see, the yellow output voltage waveform is always constant, even when there's fluctuations in the input voltage. If the input voltage is lowered below the operating level, it stops working. So as you can see, the circuit is working without any problems. This is the circuit we made today. In this video, I've been calling it a switching regulator, but it's actually called a step-down converter. This is a buck converter circuit. It has a MOSFET, a diode, inductor, and a capacitor. The MOSFET part here is the IC I was making earlier in the video. The MOSFET is in the IC. The diode, inductor, and capacitor are made using external components. These step-down converters, as the name implies, reduce the voltage. It goes about doing so by flipping the switch of the MOSFET component in the circuit. The MOSFET acts like a switch. By turning it on and off, the voltage is controlled. And that's how the buck converter reduces the voltage. All you really have to do is turn this switch on and off. It has two operations. 
The first is where the switch is on and closed, and the second is where the switch is off and open. By the way, I got rid of the capacitor here because the mechanism is much too complicated with one. What happens when the switch is on is the current flows through the switch and the inductor. The voltage at both ends of the resistor increases like this. We'll call this period T on. Now, when this T on period is over, we enter mode 2, where the switch is open. The current still continues to flow in this inductor. The current in the inductor can't instantly be reduced to zero, so it flows through this diode. Like this. If you're familiar with series circuits, hopefully you'll understand. This is how the circuit goes down. So, as a result, during mode 2, the voltage begins to drop like this. We can call this period T off. The average voltage of V2 can be seen on this dotted line I'm making. Ultimately, the voltage is determined by a ratio between T off and T on. We can actually calculate the voltage at both sides of the resistor pretty easily. This T on plus T off is for just one cycle, and that's the denominator, while the numerator is just the period of T on. This all equates to dV1, the D standing for duty ratio, which can also be thought of as conductivity in other words. By changing the T on, you can actually change the individual voltage. The longer the T on, the higher the voltage, and thus the shorter the T on, the lower the voltage. All of it is proportional to T on. Now the voltage shown here is in a zigzag, which is called voltage ripple. If you want to reduce this voltage ripple, you want to keep the ratio between T on and T off the same, and also reduce the period of this cycle. This will cause the voltage ripple to decrease. Another way of doing this is by increasing the inductor size. And if you want even further stabilization of the voltage, you can also add a capacitor to both ends of this resistor, which will help stabilize the voltage. The reason why the output voltage is always constant even when there's fluctuation in the input voltage is because we have feedback here. There is a voltage dividing resistor in the output section, and the voltage is inputted to the feedback section. Here's how this feedback works. When the input voltage becomes higher, it controls the duty ratio to be small. And when the input voltage becomes low, the duty ratio is increased. Thus, even if the input voltage fluctuates, the output voltage will always be constant at 5 volts. Right now, the input voltage is 10 volts. Since the output voltage is 5 volts, the duty ratio is about 0.5. If we increase the input ratio here, the duty ratio decreases. This is to keep the output voltage constant at 5 volts. And when the input voltage is lowered, the duty ratio increases. Looking at the datasheet, we can see that the switching frequency is fixed at 700 kHz, but in reality, it's 673 kHz. I guess it's also important to know how much ripple there is due to the output voltage. We are only looking at the voltage ripple component right now, but if you zoom in on this, you can see the voltage ripple. It's looking to be about 20 millivolts from peak to peak. This is a different circuit from a switching regulator called a linear regulator. It's a three-terminal regulator. Linear regulators also have a reputation for low noise, so let's take a look at the voltage ripple for these as well. And as you can see, there's hardly any voltage ripple at all. On this spectrum analyzer, looking at the frequency component of the voltage, I think you can see it more clearly. When measuring, make sure you use the appropriate metal case, and when you're actually taking the measurements, make sure you close the lid like this. The actual switching frequency is 0.7 MHz, but you can see the spectrum even at that frequency. You can also see the spectrum for neighboring frequencies. So, that means that there is a voltage ripple. Now, let's see what happens in the case of a three-terminal regulator. In the case of a three-terminal regulator, there is almost no ripple. So, a three-terminal regulator is a clean power supply with little or no voltage ripple. 
However, the loss of a three-terminal regulator is large, but that's the trade-off. So to recap, today I made a switching regulator, where everything is part of one IC. This means the MOSFET, the control circuit, and the protection circuit are all part of it, which makes it very convenient. You can also make it pretty easily. Now the ripple of the switching regulator is a bit large, so you'll have to choose what you want to use it for, but I think it should be okay for electronic crafts. I like how it can be used for variable input voltage, and also compared to linear regulators, it generates less heat, which is nice. If you enjoyed this video, please comment and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching.